Well, hello and welcome one and all to this LinkedIn Live SAP Business Technology Platform event. My name's Holly Ransom and I'm so excited to get to play the role of master of this conversation, facilitating two phenomenal experts in the space of technology platforms, change and innovation. So let's set a little bit of the context for the conversation that we're going to have today. Probably many of you joining will resonate with the fact that the need for innovation, agility and speed matters now more than arguably it have as ever has done. You know, we've watched the last 18 months, this need for rapid execution, the, uh, the need to be able to flip business models, be responsive to customer needs and dramatic changes in the circumstances and the delivery model. Uh, it's been quite phenomenal to watch the rate of business innovation. And today we're going to delve into what makes business innovation work, what role does technology play in that? How does technology complement good business strategy, culture? What does it take to put innovation at the core of what we do? All these big questions. Now, none of this world's gonna change immediately post pandemic. Business has gotta to continue to innovate at scale and with speed in order to secure their future success. Innovation with technology is a proven differentiator. And that's that sweet spot combination that we wanna delve into today with two experts in the field. So without further ado, allow me to introduce the two people I'm very excited to pick the brains off today. First up, we have Alex Borak, who is an experienced data and AI leader, author and keynote speaker. He supports tech and established companies on their data journeys. He's currently head of data at Zalando. He manages a number of central tech teams for data platform, business intelligence, machine learning, business process mining and CRM. In his previous role, he served as the Global Head of Data Analytics and AI at Volkswagen Financial Services. Before that, he led the data analytics transformation at the Volkswagen Group and worked as a consultant at Gartner and at IBM, where he advised global Fortune 500 executives in multiple industries. If you're looking to find his handiwork, you can check out his latest book. He co-authored The Ultimate Data and AI Guide, as well as Total Information Risk Management, marketing with smart machines and driving digital transformation through data and AI, prolifically published. Uh, welcome, Alex, to the conversation. Thank you, Holly. Thank you for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to be on stage with you and also with you, Raghu. And next up to that end, perfect segue, I would love to introduce Raghu Ramanathan, who's the Chief Revenue Officer, Platform and Technology at SAP. Now, that's a big role, and as a member of the executive leadership team at SAP, he's responsible for driving business growth and customer success in the fast-growing fast growing platform and technology organization, which includes everything from database and data management, analytics, and platform solutions. Since joining SAP in 2004, he's become synonymous with uh, developing a track record for accelerating growth. He's also known throughout the industry for his deep understanding of customer needs. Prior to SAP, he had over 12 years of experience as a recognized business leader in the telecommunications and financial services industry. He was an associated partner at McKinsey & Company and co-founder of Bluesoft, a wireless technology startup funded by Intel and Cisco. Welcome, Raghu. It's wonderful to have you here as part of the conversation today as well. Great pleasure to be with you, Holly, and with you, Alex, as well. Raghu, I might come to you first. I mean, in setting the scene a little bit for the conversation today, we, we touched on this notion that you know, or technology done well is an absolute key to future business success and that speed and agility are absolutely critical components of that. I would love to just step back for a moment though and get your thoughts. What are your beliefs about companies of the future? What is gonna be key to enabling future business success? Thank you, Holly. So as you rightly said, with COVID, with the pandemic, it's only accelerated the demand for digital transformation. People realize more and more these days that digital transformation is vital to have a business model that's robust for the future and not just for the past. And if you think about digital transformation, most companies tend to believe that if you've installed a new software system, say for your commerce or your supply chain or your production manufacturing, you've done digital transformation and it can't be further from the truth. The reality of digital transformation is most of these systems that you're installing are just starting to generate data. And the real companies which transform know how to benefit from the data and exploit the data. Whereas the companies that do not do real digital transformation treat the data as a, let's call it a byproduct, necessary or unnecessary, and they don't really benefit from it. And Raghu, I absolutely love the data angle you're taking. Uh, so plus one from me. 
Um, <laughs> and I, I would open that a, a bit wider as well, because, you, you know, when you look at companies uh, of the future, I think there are three main characteristics. One is uh, we, we've seen that platform businesses start to win. You know, if you look at uh, Amazon, Apple, uh, they each of them is more worth than the entire top 30 companies in Germany. Uh, and that is, you know, mostly because we are a platform business and most of our companies in Germany are not. Um, so, so, so that is that is really a big, uh, big, big uh, thing to to watch out if you're a company. Can you create a platform of a sort? And as Zalando, you know, we, we are a fashion tech company. We're cr trying to create, you know, the leading platform, fashion platform, the starting point uh, for fashion, for consumers to, to look for fashion needs in Europe, where we connect brands with consumers. So that's our part of how we take a, a, a platform approach. And we also heavily during the pandemic uh, connected um, retail stores online um, so they can sell via our platform. And this is exactly where the sweet spot uh, is. The second characteristic uh, from my perspective is, you know, really tech and data driven. And that was also, you know, pointed out by Ragu, you know, I worked in the automotive industry where uh, where we had Tesla coming in. Uh, you know, when we started five years ago, Tesla uh, at the digital transformation there, Tesla was still a small player. Now it's, you know, it's worth more than all the big automotive companies. And, and, and you know, you could argue, you know, is, is that the right uh, um, uh, market capitalization uh, or is it overrated? But what you clearly can see is that they made everything right when it comes to software, you know. Um, the, the car moved away from being a hardware driven product with electrification you have a much simpler hardware architecture and the software architecture plays a major role and Tesla has done everything right and and all the automotive companies have slept for, for too long and you know now they're catching up but you really see you know software and data uh, by the way with autonomous driving cars data will play an even more important role in the automotive industry will make a big difference and the third part, and that's, but you know, beyond digital transformation, is really sustainability. I don't think, you know, that investors will look into old fashioned models, which rely on fossil fuels, which rely on, uh, you know, a lot of carbon. So, you know, at, at Salando, you know, we, we, we have a big pillar of our strategies really in sustainability. And I, I would encourage every company to do that as well. If you look at Austria, you know, um, a Danish energy company, they, they made a big transition from fossil fuels to, 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 to renewable energy and now are, you know, have outgrown. They've been really in financial troubles a few years ago. Now they are outgrown a lot of the big energy players. Uh, and, and you really see, you know, that investors and the consumers are looking into that. Um, and if you want to be future proof, you need to invest into that. I love that piece, Raghu, that you mentioned about making the data work for you and knowing how to exploit your data. Like, how is it meaningful and value adding? And then, Alex, the fact that you took us into that sustainability piece when we know how big that conversation is around purpose oriented companies, triple bottom line, this ESG conversation that's emerging, emerging throughout the business community. Raghu, I want to, if I can, talk a little bit more about this digital transformation piece because I feel like it's a phrase you see everywhere, you hear everywhere. But I want to ask both of you, Raghu, I'll come to you first. What does doing digital transformation really mean? Yeah. So, so before I answer that question, Holly, you know, I, I, a thought triggered to me from, from what Alex was saying. So if I could pick that up. Um, Alex, you mentioned that more and more the valuation of these companies, platform-based companies, is greater than the legacy companies, right? Now, I have a slightly financial background. And if you look at this, uh, you can add up all the assets, right, of a company, and it needs to add to its equal to its market value, right? Simple accounting. In most companies, you can look at how much inventory do they have, what's the value of the brand, what's the value of the real estate that they sit on, uh, what's the value of the franchise, and you can add it all up, right? If you take an airline company, you know, and it's a very interesting exercise, you add up all the air, air, you know, aircraft that's sitting, uh, in the hangar, and that's the actually the market value. There's nothing more to it, right? So that's how they are uh, they, they are valued. But if you go to a company like a Tesla or a Facebook, you know there is no such relationship. You take all of those assets, and that's still only ten percent of the market value. So the question is, what's the remaining ninety percent? And the answer is the power of the data that they sit on, right? So I think I think that that's some, that's a point I wanted to make. 
Now, if you come back to it, to, to your, your, your question, Holly, in terms of what does real digital transformation leveraging all this data look like? Why is this data worth 80, 90% of your future market value? Um, I, I see uh, three simple things. First, many companies, first of all, need to unleash the data. This is what I call data democratization. Data is much more powerful sitting with the frontline employees who make decisions day in, day out, mm -hmm. not just CEOs and board members who are sitting isolated from the front line. So I think that's that's one principle. The second principle is the real power of data kicks in when you can drive automation or machine augmented decisions. More and more these days, there is no reason to maintain the manual processes that we actually run. A lot of these things can be automated, be it, be it a customer complaint in a call center, be it an invoice reconciliation can be automated. Similarly, a lot of decisions can be taken in a better fashion, but when it's augmented by machines, like quality testing, we are working with a consumer products company on how based on cameras, based on machine data, you can support the person running the quality system to make better decisions on which batch is approved from a quality perspective or not. And then the third and final level of really delivering, de deriving this data and driving digital transformation is when data itself becomes the product, right? So rather than my earlier analogy, when people think data is a byproduct, right? Okay, you know, what do I do with a side product to my main business? You need to put in data into your product. Imagine if you're selling an aircraft <clears throat> with a lot of data around the performance of the engines and on various conditions, it's worth a lot more. Uh, there is, again, a consumer products company we work with. They are uh, digitizing and providing data on the entire supply chain to their customers. So you can scan the barcode and you can figure out where this product came from, how was it organically sourced, and that adds a premium to the value that the customers are willing to pay. So, you know, in a nutshell, those those are, you know, for me, the three three key pillars of how you do this. I love your point about the valuation and the way that you took us there into the the role of democratization of data, the the piece around augmentation and uh, automation, and also that finish there on how is it actually adding a premium value to your product. Alex, I want to give you a right to engage in that topic, but I'd also love to take you to this notion of data at every level, which is something I know you're really passionate about, because I think sometimes we can hear conversations like this and we think, wow, SAP and Zalando, yes, that's a scale of business that, you know, absolutely has the ability to get their head around data and do data well. But what does doing data well at any level in any size organisation look like? How can leaders listening to this conversation who are in smaller businesses uh, perhaps be thinking about this topic? Right. So I think, you know, if you, if you looked at, in the, uh, at that in the context of uh, digital transformation, um, as, a, as, a, as a more established company, you need to think, is your business model actually changing? <laughs> That's what you need to start with, off with. Because oftentimes times it does, you know, when, when you look at, 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 you know, my previous uh, um, company, Volkswagen, you know, uh, what the business model has changed significantly, you know, from, from normal cars to, to, to electrified cars, to autonomous cars, to from dealer-based uh, sales to omni-channel sales uh, and retail. I mean, that's a massive shift in the business model. So, you know, at Zalando, we've been uh, set up as an e-commerce and we're staying in e-commerce and our shift is more from, you know, normal e-commerce to a platform business. So that's our shift in business model. But most often, you know, since we are living in such a dynamic wor world, even if you're a new player like us, you know, a bit more than a decade, found in 2008 uh, at Zalando, uh, your model is most likely shifting. And that's what you need to look at first um, and adapt your business model according to that. And then you need to look at, you know, where is, you know, where, where are my, my core capabilities? Where do I need to be better than the market? Um, and, and for an automotive, you know, that, that was clearly, you know, we need to get, uh, you know, our retail right, uh, you know, to be omnichannel. Uh, because dealer-based uh, uh, sales was a very stronghold, much a stronghold for the automotive industry, and we had to bring that to the 20th century. And you know, and we have to invest in our cars to make it electrified, uh, make it run by software and 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 by algorithms, and and make it autonomous. Um, um, so that's a big shift in, in in building up that software and that algorithms uh, in those core capabilities. 
also in manufacturing, you need to put that into Industry 4.0 if you're an automotive because that's your core capability. And you need to put all this data, all that software, all that algorithm into place to, to make your manufacturing processes extremely automated, lean and, 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 and resilient. Um, while if you're, you know, uh, an e-commerce player uh, like Zalando, you know, we, we, we need to, to put, um, invest into data, algorithms and, and software in almost every aspect of our e-commerce and platform offering. So, I mean, a big thing, for example, is our sizing. You know, a key thing is to, to determine the right size for you uh, in terms of, you know, wh when you buy with us, you know, as a consumer, that's part an integral part of your experience to get the right size of a cloth. It's the pricing. It's what we recommend to you. It's how we connect our brands with you uh, on the platform, how we manage our brands. All these things, you know, we, we, we invested deeply into, into our own software systems, into our own uh, um, algorithms, and, of course, in the data itself and, and making that data interconnected. So, in a way, you know, productivity with data and data democratization for us is actually on two layers. One is for those data builders, for all those ML, machine learning people, machine learning engineers, uh, um, and data engineers that sit in each of the business function, integrated with the business function, and empower them with data, bringing you know a data platform in place which, where everyone can get the data out they need because data runs across uh, the business. Plus, you want to also empower the business side, the business users, and we you want to make data as easy to use in making you know day to day. Uh, um, decisions very data driven and not you know based on gut feel. If you're on a platform in a platform business with we have 40 million consumers uh, operating on a platform, you need to understand what those consumers are doing uh, in every step. You need to understand where do we have problems in the logistics chain, where is the friction on the website, where does a, a brand partner not deliver to the customer value. All these things you need to see almost in real time and be able to react. Um, so, so I could really encourage you know every business to think where are your core competence? Where do you need to be differentiating, and invest there in, in data um, and in the software and reuse platforms, underlying platforms, uh, you know because that's not your core business, usually. Rugu, I'm watching you nod a lot while Alex is talking there. Anything you'd like to add to what he's just shared there? Yeah, indeed, right. And and um, coming coming back to your question, what do small companies do, right? I think I think large companies have the resources to go and create their own platform, like a Facebook, like a Tesla, right? But and Zalando is somewhere in the middle. But smaller companies these days, the good news is that there are out of the box technology platforms that can get them started. So that, so that, you know, rather than trying to reinvent everything from scratch, rather than believing that they're out of the game because they don't have the resources, the game is that you start with a tech platform that's closest to what you want to achieve. And then exactly like Alex said, you can build in soft intellectual property on the platform, like your own algorithms, for example. So that, that, that's, that's the strategy. I love that. Now, we've talked a lot about platforms. Alex, you've made it really clear uh, the primacy that getting platforms right has to future business success. I want to delve into that a little bit with you if we can. Why is getting your technology platform right so critical, particularly in this moment in time? Well, because I guess, you know, at the end, your business platform is based on that. You know, if you think about it, you know, you try, uh, if, even if you're a niche player, it's good to, to become a kind of a platform business which connects uh, you know, buyers and sellers or con uh, connects uh, producers with consumers. Um, and you can't scale that without technology. So, so you need technology to, to scale that engagement and, and, and bridge that gap uh, between the people you want to connect on your platform. And the technology platform is basically the thing that everyone, every business department can then build on and build their own business and, and, and tech functionality on top of, of the platform. If everyone need to, would need to you know, start from scratch, uh, that would be, you know, would be not fast, it would be not you know, scalable, it would be not innovative, it would create a lot of security problems. Um, so reusing a central platform and building your thing on top accelerates that journey, makes it, makes it safer, makes it more reliable, um, and, and makes it much more cost efficient. And it makes it interconnected because a platform, a business platform needs to interconnect different business capabilities. 
And that is very difficult if you do don't if you don't do that on a platform. If you try, you know, if everyone does their own thing and you don't have an uh, a backbone architecture behind that, a back something which which everyone you know knows they need to connect and they should connect to, uh, then it's very difficult to later on you know try to connect the pieces and make an integrated uh, experience for your your consumers, for your um, customers, for your suppliers, uh, and 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 uh, you know making collaboration inside your enterprise effective. So, Raghu, I mean, Alex has touched on a couple of things there in terms of the characteristics and the qualities, the capabilities that make for getting a good data platform. But can you expand on that? What does doing this right look like? What are we talking about in a, in a practical sense? Yeah, indeed. You know, I have my um, <clears throat> own favorite theories, Holly, in terms of what such a platform, a data platform should provide. I think, I think there are two things that are top of my list. So the first one is... The whole idea of a data platform is that it should support decentralization and not always assume centralization. Centralization was a mode of working which defined companies in the past, whatever, one century or so. But it's certainly not the way it's going to operate with the modern technologies in the future generation. Um, so, so I'm, you know, for example, just to give you an interesting analogy, I used to be a consultant, as you were telling in your introduction, and when I was working for McKinsey, there was this big drive to centralize all the knowledge that every McKinsey consultant had in one central repository accessible throughout the world, right? So that was the model that we operated in. And, and then you realize as time goes by, this is very difficult to make everybody commit to. And good luck to you to have every consultant working off their project to get that data into a central place. But with modern technologies, we can now leave data where it is and we can connect rather than collect data and, and drive that intelligence through a fabric, right? So I think, I think that's one central philosophy. The second one that I also think about is today there are all kinds of data. There is structured data, there's geographic geospatial data, there's relationship data, there's um, text data, and how all this comes together it to, to uh, create one coherent picture is a real challenge. So a good platform should support that. Take, for example, you have a critical part that is somewhere in your supply chain, which is blocking your production, right? It's not just enough to know what is the specification of that part. Uh, you also need to know where exactly it is geographically. You also need to know who's the supplier, what is the relationship of the supplier to other companies that you've dealt with, what is their track record, uh, what is the latest news about the supplier that's coming in the press? You, you know, it allows you to build a composite picture. So that's the beauty of this. And modern data platforms will not be unidimensional. They'll be truly multimodal, multidimensional, and allow you to, to, to make sense of multiple facets of data to make the best decision. So maybe to just, you know, um, underpin it with something, you know, we do at, at Zalando, you know, we, we have a central data platform, data lake, uh, where where basically everyone publishes their data. Um, of course, not everyone is allowed to access automatically. You know, there are, of course, uh, uh, processes around access, uh, depending on what role you're on, if you're allowed to see that data or not. Uh, but it is in a central place uh, um, without being a central platform that rules it all. You, you can still move in your pace as you want, decentralized, and it's up to you what you publish in that lane. Um, and then, you know, it's all about making that available for others, make, making that searchable and making that meaningful. And with meaningful means, you know, adding the metadata, having a kind of, you know, a way of sharing information about what are your most critical pieces of data? Or what are your data blockbusters, you know, uh, that everyone uh, wants to use or should use? And in particular for those blockbusters, yeah, you need to make sure that data quality is right and transparent. You understand, you know, where that data is coming from, that you can trust the data and that you can understand the data very, very well. Um, and that's sort of Alex, if I, can, if I can add to that, right? So, so this goes very well with, uh, in SAP, what we are now talking about, which is the data marketplace, right? It's not a data command and control, like one ring to rule the world, right? It's, it's like, a, yeah, so it's it's also about, uh, you know, what we call a marketplace and creating true incentives for people to share, to deliver value and to reward those who are contributing the most important things. 
So I want to, I guess, ask the flip side of this question. We've touched on a few of the things that really make platforms work effectively, the characteristics people need to be mindful of, leaders who are thinking about the transformation of their business to a platform business, some of the things they need to be really cognizant of building into their strategy and putting as a lens over the, the different platforms they're considering. What I want to ask you is the, the flip side. When this goes wrong, when platform technology fails, where have people misstepped? What are the kind of minds that people need to be aware of in the minefield? Because this is a very complicated space. So what can we be wary of to make sure we misstep and avoid making any mistakes? Alex, I'll come to you first. So, I mean, it's on a spectrum and, and the balancing act is, is the difficult one. You know, it, it fails when you become a central bottleneck as a platform. Then you clearly fail because then you kill a lot of the speed and innovation entrepreneurship across the business units. Um, at the same time, you fail if it's chaos on your platform. If nobody can reuse central data products, um, if you cannot trust and have to be rebuild everything by yourself, uh, if you cannot, uh, you know, uh, trust how you see your company, uh, what do you report to your, to your, to to externals, you know, to your to the markets. Uh, if that is becoming a problem, you know. You, you definitely fail as a platform. So, so, so the truth lies somewhere in between. How can we create that that uh, dynamic way of uh, you know, working together while being able to interconnect critical data components and making you know and to create a big picture of the company data wise? You know, you want to know how you perform across the business units, not only within one business unit. You need to plan. You know for the next year across business units and not only within one business unit and incorporate also your corporate strategy in that. And for that, you know, that interconnectivity is really, really important. So, so basically, you know, central bottlenecks uh, um, create big problems. Uh, of course, not being a reliable platform creates big problems. Uh, um, but, but also, you know, if you're not able to interconnect and to ensure quality and, and that people can take a value out of the, the platform. And that is a very, very tricky balancing act. Definitely. Raghu, I'm intrigued for your thoughts, but one of the things that's come through really strongly for me in this conversation is that importance of breaking out of silos. And to your point earlier that you touched on, that ability to facilitate a much more decentralised model and this through line of what Alex has been talking about, which is collaboration, integration. What, what would you add? What are common missteps people need to be mindful of avoiding? Yeah, so, so first of all... Um, I just want to say you're, you're entirely right, Holly. So um, I was looking at some statistics um, around digital transformation. And even companies which are supposed to be very digitally oriented, like telecom and media companies, have about a 30% rate of success in digital transformation. And it's even more dire when you talk about like oil and gas or some of the more legacy industries, their success rate uh, is is closer to 10% or so. Clearly, clearly, technology platform is part of that. You know, without a technology platform, the transformation is not possible. But technology platform is not the only reason for successful transformation. A lot of this is softer issues around the management, around the organization, around the culture. That is actually what determines as well the success of the transformation. There are several aspects that I could point to, uh, but perhaps the most important one that I would like to point to is the, is the fact that the management estab established a clear change story and a rationale for the transformation. This is easier for a younger company like Zalando because I think you know, they are coming in as challengers, but if you look at more established companies, uh, they are stuck in the way that they do things currently and they need to establish the case for change. They need to become a challenger, which is very hard when you're a leader to try to pretend that you're a challenger. But this is the culture that will differentiate them. This is the culture that will drive whether digital transformation is taken seriously or not. Alex, I want to come to you because uh, Raghu's really hit on something that uh, was where I want to take the conversation next. You've said to me in conversation before, the, the issue is not the platform, it's change management. Can you explain a little bit about that based on your observations and your working history? Why does that so often where things fall down and what can leaders really cognizant that this is the direction they need to be heading in, be really mindful of doing in their execution? 
So look, uh, when when I joined uh, Volkswagen Group uh, f five years back, you know, uh, I was one of the first uh, leadership hires in the digital transformation at the group, and uh, we knew we we have to change the company from head to toe, you know, uh, and basically the major shift was, you know, from a hardware uh, business to a to a software business, and from a, uh, B to B to C business to a B to C uh, business, um, and that's that's major shift in in, in 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 the logic, and so I can I can just say you know digital transformation is so much pain it's so much change that it's sometimes overwhelming and it's oftentimes overwhelming for that company because you need to change your business model you need to change the capabilities plus the culture all three at the same time, and that is the difficulty. So, you know, in the case of automotive, the business model changed to, you know, to electrified autonomous cars with, with omni-channel retail uh, and, and, and mobility, uh, uh, you know, subscription models rather than buying your own car. Uh, you, you had to build up all that software capabilities, um, uh, um, you know, uh, how to build a car is now, you know, to a large degree building software. Um, and, and, and then you have to, to, to change the incentive models and how we work. You have to bring in leadership in, the, in tech and data uh, and in, in platform business and, and, you know, uh, and, and also challenge the existing leadership with regards how they think about the car architecture. Uh, you know, so, so you have to, you know, you have people who have for decades built a car a certain way and suddenly you build it a different way. That's a massive change in, 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 in leadership and in mindset, in skills, um, and also in incentives. So when, when you go to, to an omnichannel channel uh, business model, uh, you have to you know, leave that car dealership centric thinking behind and think about omnichannel. How do you connect online with offline you know, um, and make it as seamless as possible? For that, we incentivized you know, both our dealers and also all our sales uh, uh, um, sales organization uh, you know to, to 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 look at customer engagement consumer engagement rather than uh, uh, and also online sales plus offline sales rather than just looking at offline sales if you just look at dealer based sales you would not need uh, or just look at sales overall you would not move the needle uh, towards omni channel retail because of course you're coming from a business model where such a huge amount of of sales is still done in Deal in the dealership that you'd have no incentive to look at those small business uh, volumes, you know, in your in your new business models. So you somehow have to change the incentives to to incentivize and also how you measure things, how to incentivize that change. Um, and and we, we basically completely remade how we how we steer the business based on that. And so that I is love really that point important. about incentives. I think that's a really key one because I think so often misaligned incentives is one of the main causes of drag behind, you know, we might have set the strategy in this direction, but the business in terms of turning the Titanic takes some time to follow if the incentives don't match up or worse. If they're misaligned, you're going to have this continuous friction with the new direction you want to head in. Raghu, I want to come to you quickly. Both you and Alex have touched on this case for change and this need to, to build a sense of urgency behind the transformation. I, I want to ask you, you know, for those who are listening, who are going, I'm on board, I'm hearing everything you're throwing, but I'm struggling getting my executive team to all buy in. My board are really just not on the same page yet. I can't get this urgency across. Would love your advice. What's what's the way you'd encourage them to think about making the case for change, to get cut through with people who maybe aren't there yet? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, Holly. And, and um, I, I think, first of all, um, you need to start with a fundamental belief all in, across all layers of management that this is central to your existence, your future existence. If that level of common understanding hasn't been established, uh, then you're not tuned to the dangers that exist, that lurk in the digital world that are coming at you in the next years. So I think this is, this is the place to start. The place to start is just to, just to convince all of the management that Look, you know, here are the competitors. Here's what they are doing. Here's where things can be 10, 15 years in the future if you don't get that. The, the other part as well is what, what I've observed of companies who have done this transformation very successfully is how they set it up. And it's actually a lesson because the companies that don't do very well, 
are very departmentalized and siloed in the way they ap approach digital transformation. They treat this as, hey, you know, I have my finance department, I have my sales department, they're all digitizing, right? And somehow we'll connect the pieces together and somehow we'll have a new digital strategy and that doesn't work. So the best companies I've seen are, you know, they're creating a new role, like a chief digital officer or a COO with a digital mandate or, or a role like Alexis perhaps. Mm -hmm. and, and they're basically saying, look, you know, this particular role is so important it reports to the CEO and they're going to bring all the pieces across the company together and they go and look for the best people in each department. They pull them out of the jobs and saying this is so important that for the next year, next two years, this is all you're going to do. And this is a great career for you. You are at the heart of the transformation and they lift up these people and they showcase these people. Alex, I want to come to you because I think your business is a fascinating one in the context of where the world is heading. You've got this great fusion of data skills, technology capabilities and creatives. And I think it's really interesting because we have this conversation often around how literate do you need the whole of the business to be about data? How much does everyone need to understand this world? Or is it OK to just have your tech team and all the people that are running your platform and responsible for that being the ones that have their head around this? I'd be interested for your take on that, but also how you've made that culture work so effectively, because arguably they're two different sides of the brain. You know, we're talking about pure creatives and then the, the data side and the science piece. How have you melded that so well together at Zalando? Right. And, and I think this, this is something that, that is a key, I think, for a lot of companies. You know, you have two pieces that need to fit together. You have something that you 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 really need to be great at because that's the coffee industry and for us that's the fashion dna and the second part is usually the tech that comes you know uh, also into play because that's the second part it's almost like, like your yin and yang you know if you want to be successful you need to be good in what you do plus tech and put those pieces together that they really support each other and in our case as mentioned you know it's, it's really bringing those creatives uh, and also those you know people who have that you know that fashion mindset, which is a very different mindset than a tech mindset, into uh, uh, play and work very effectively with our engineers. Um, and the way we, 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 we've done that is, is, you know, first of all, it's, it's, it's your own understanding of who you are as a business, you know. Our understanding is we are, the, we are a tech company that connects, you know, fashion brands with consumers. And everyone follows that sort of mission and purpose, you know, connect those brands with the consumers. Um, and that's something that unites us. That's that big mission. The second thing is we put people next to each other, you know, in the same, in each business unit, you have tech teams and you have business teams and they work side by side daily together. It's not a central tech team that you need to work with. We have central tech team that provide the platforms, but it's really, you know, you have your own tech team that understands your business domain very, very well. And vice versa, you know, those our fashion and business uh, part of that uh, equation also starts to think in a tech way. You know, they think about how can we optimize things with, with those technologies. And I think the common value is that we're trying to solve business problems together, that we try, you know, that problem solver mindset and that entrepreneurial mindset is sort of the glue because we together try to, to solve that problem of how to effectively, you know, connect the consumers with our brands. Um, and that's, that, that creates a very interesting dynamic that is more difficult to, to imitate because, you, you know, once you have that common understanding and common collaboration established down to every level um, and everyone working with each, each day, that is, that is not so easy to copy for others. Absolutely. I love that piece uh, that you talked about. You've got to be good at what you do plus tech and that simplicity of that idea of you've just got to have people put people together. You've got to have those parts of the business coming together with that shared understanding of the problem that they're trying to solve. Raghu, I'd love your thoughts on the data literacy piece, but I'd also love your opinion on this whole challenge around how you bring innovation to the core of what you do as a business. So it's not in some siloed innovation unit or it's not the thing we do once a year at a hackathon. How do you actually bring it to the heart of how the business operates? Yeah, so, so there is one thing which, um, you know, I believe Alex mentioned it once when I was speaking with him, and I really think that's the right approach, which is you need to think about scaling very quickly in the business. 
a lot of times when people do digital transformation, they think, okay, let's do a small pilot here, a small pilot there. Let's see the results in 12 months time, 18 months time. And by that time, the world has changed, the strategy has changed, and, and you know, all, all you have to do is you've got, you, you got to start again from square one. So, so one of the things that really needs to be a blueprint for digital transformation is how do I accelerate at scale? How do I not just think about laboratory pilots, but large scale rollouts as well? So I think that that's one thing. There is also one other thing that's close to my heart, Holly, which is at the end of the day, digital transformation is about human beings and, and convincing human beings to behave differently. And, and the way, only way it works is if they know that there's a path for them in the future. So companies need to heavily, heavily invest in reskilling people. This is at the heart of successful transformations because all a person is thinking is, okay, the company wants me to do it. I intellectually agree, but if I go down this route, my current job doesn't exist. <laughs> so, so why am I doing this for? So, so you need to invest in them and show them like, okay, here's your possible role in the future. This could be more fun, more exciting. It's a way to take your career to the next level. So that's the part that's important as well in digital transformations. And I guess, you know, uh, you, you, you touch very important points. And I also saw that, you know, my current role, but also my past role is a key thing that it's a collaborative approach and that people that are affected by the change are also in the driver's seat for that change and determine their future together with the people that are doing that change. If you get that right, and if you also work with them on what's next for them, um, they will be also upskilled during that process, supporting you during that change already. If you provide you know, some, some, some opportunities for training, plus going through that journey, uh, and implementing some of the systems together with you and some of those, uh, you know, tech and data functionalities with you, that will already, you know, upskill them. Um, and, and since they are, you know, with you on the driver's seat and create those solutions together, they will accept those, uh, you know, new ways of working much better and, and, and put all the creative energy because a lot of these people have that industry know-how that you lack more on the data and tech side uh, into work. So your algorithms are much more... Um, much more adapted to, to, to really the, 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 what the business reality is and not, you know, some kind of theory. I think that point around reskilling, the role that that has in the future of business success, but also the responsibility we have as business leaders to be play an active role in that retraining and reskilling is such an important one. We have flown our time and it's just come and gone and I want to make sure we give both of you the opportunity for some closing remarks. We've covered a lot of territory. We've talked about what it is that's going to enable future business success. We've talked about the fundamental characteristics and capabilities of good platform technology. And we've also extended to the fact that good platform technology isn't enough and that culture and innovation, the business model that wraps around it is absolutely key to making sure that that achieves success. Alex, I'm gonna to come to you first. If leaders listening to this could, could leave with one thought, one action, one thing you're encouraging them to go and do, what would that one thing be? I think it's probably what Regu started off with, you know. At the end, data is a key part of your business, you know. Making data work across departments and making, democratize your data assets and make both builders but also normal business units productive using data uh, will be a key changer uh, for your business. And bring those people, those two sides together, the, the data and tech side and the business side, and very closely collaborating in that. I love it. Understand data's power and make sure you're bringing that side of your business and the business part together to work collaboratively. Raghu, what would you add to Alex's closing thoughts? You know, I'd just like to reinforce that for all the leaders out there, how you use your data is going to be the difference between success and failure in the next decade. So that's, that's as simple as it is. And the second thing that you need to do once you recognize that is you need to start to look at what is your data platform today and is it fit for purpose for the future? And that's the exercise that every good leader needs to run and come to their own conclusions. I love that. Make sure that your platform is future fit with regards to how you're thinking about using data. Well, Alex Raghu, on behalf of everyone listening, uh, thank you so much for your insights, your openness, uh, all of the perspectives that you shared today uh, about both the industry at large as well as the transformations that you yourselves have been involved with. 
It's been a personal pleasure to be able to facilitate this conversation. I know I've learned a lot and I hope everyone listening has too. When we think about as we opened with the role that innovation, leadership, the criticality that agility and speed are going to play in both of those things, the way that they're going to define companies that win in 2021 and beyond. I think what Alex and Raghu have really helped us unpack today is a number of the mindsets and the strategies that we need to be thinking through as leaders to make sure we can position the business success as the world rapidly transforms. For any more information that you might want on SAP Business Technology Platform, please visit sap.com slash btp where you can learn all about the leading solutions. You can sign up for a product demo or you can contact a specialist and learn more about how this might be able to provide business and tech value to your organisation. Thanks so much for listening. It's been a pleasure to host um, and we'll leave it there with today's SAP 